Okay, Psalm 134. Psalm 134. One of the shortest uh, of all the Psalms, and of course, if you want to call it a chapter, probably the next to the last or next to the shortest of all the Psalms and of, of uh, chapters in the Bible, uh, Psalm 117 being the shortest. But in one, uh, Psalm 134, this is the last of the songs of ascent. And uh, we know that talking about the pilgrims as they would go to Jerusalem during the, feast, the festivals and the feast days. And so, uh, and this is more of a benediction. This is a, a kind of a blessing. And it's uh, the first two verses deal with the, the pilgrims blessing the workers. And then the last uh, verse is uh, the priest blessing the pilgrims as they depart. So it says, Behold, bless the Lord, all ye servants of the Lord, who by night stand by the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. The Lord made, the Lord who made heaven and earth, bless you from Zion. So we see now that uh, uh, this is a benediction as far as the people as they are leaving. And I don't know if, if you've ever been in a uh, revival meeting or I think of camp uh, or a time when you've had a sustained period of just really great blessing where God has blessed you, your heart with the singing, with the fellowship, with the preaching. God has spoken to your heart repeatedly and now it's time to put depart. This would be that uh, situation. Now, there are those who say, well, this is the, maybe during the night seasons, and of course, we'll see in the psalm that uh, worship at the temple was 24 7. There were certain things that were to be done and guarded 24 uh, 7. So we'll look at that in a moment. So some people think that this might have been one of those nights when people were leaving or whatever. But uh, I like what Spurgeon, uh, and the only way that he can do it, he just paints a beautiful picture of the saints now getting up before five o'clock in the morning before it gets real hot and departing. As they're departing, they're singing back to the people on the walls who are watching them leave. And then the people in verse three sing back to them. And he really paints, as only Spurgeon can, um, paints such beautiful pictures of that great blessing uh, that comes from being in the house of the Lord. So this is the last of the Pilgrim Psalms, 120 through 124. And um, as a result, they remember the songs of the choirs and uh, the 24, hour, 24 hours a day. We see that in Psalm 92 and 1 Chronicles 9, 33, where it says they were appointed and David appointed singers. And remember the 24 elders, which would represent the 24 courses of priests that David set up would be, who would be in the temple at that time. And so, um, and, and to be able to do some of the things such as uh, the fire at the altar. And remember, Zacharias did that, or Zechariah, um, with uh, John over in, the, in Luke chapter 1, where he went. And, and there were so many priests by that time that if you were able to do that once or twice in your lifetime, then you were very fortunate. And so that's the reason when Zacharias did that, that uh, his family was outside waiting for him because this was a great festival for him. This is a great time that uh, finally um, Zachariah, who's an older man, is able to, uh, to perform the, uh, the, th the, um, the fire at the altar where they would uh, brush out the old and put in the new wood and so forth. And that fire was to never go out. It symbolized the perpetual presence of the Lord. And so we see that, uh, first of all, in verses 1 and 2 then, we have the exhortation to the, to the servants of the Lord. And so that, imagine now these people as they're leaving, and they're singing back to the people on the walls or in the halls of the temple or whatever. And he says, bless, oh, behold, I mean, listen, behold. Bless the Lord, all ye servants of the Lord, who by night stand in the house of the Lord. And so we see that the idea of blessing the Lord, of course, we can't bless the Lord more, any more than, of course, he's the one who blesses us, but the idea is we're pouring out our heart to him and we are blessing him just by, by blessing him. 
You know, we're trying to please him by blessing him. And so we want to be pleasing to him. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Tune me up, Lord, to bless the Lord with all my heart. And so that is what's pleasing to the Lord. That would be Psalm 103 that I just quoted. But, um, and so we notice now the direction, all you servants. And he is saying, bless the Lord. Don't let your perpetual service to the Lord become mundane. One of the dangers of the ministry, one of the dangers of a ministry in the church is that you do the same things many times over and over again and sooner or later becomes routine or ritual or just, okay, I just go through the motions. How do we keep it fresh? As a pastor, how do I keep it fresh with the people? How do I change things up without destroying the dignity? And yet I don't want to compete with the world and uh, get things so excited that every time you come in, if you're always trying to create excitement, you start competing against yourself because even excitement gets boring. Well, what are you going to do to top that? But at the same time, you want it to be that warm, flowing sense that uh, I am his and he is mine. And the dignity and the joy of the fellowship, uh, not always super high and definitely not always super low, but just that, hey, this is, this is where I belong. These are my people. This is the Lord that I love. And so don't ever let it become mundane. And so this is what they're praying back to them. We know that many times in Israel's history, it did become mundane. And in fact, it got downright perverted at times. But we see that all ye servants, so that'd be the priests, the singers, the custodians, anybody. And of course, with thousands of people coming through there, you had to have a lot of people with dustpans. You had to have a lot of people picking things up. You ever, if, I remember going to Disney World and you just have all these guys going around with their little dust, rooms and dustpans, always keeping it clean. Well, you can imagine what it would be like to be in a temple and with all these people from all over the world coming through. And so you'd have all kinds of workers. In fact, we're going to get into uh, Chronicles, Second Chron First Chronicles later. And uh, there's a verse that um, I don't have the, the um, uh, exact verse right now, but it says two by, uh, two by Parbar and three by the causeway. And that's a verse in Chronicles. And uh, an older preacher one time, he, he took, showed that to me and he said, boy, doesn't that preach? Two by Parbar and three by the causeway. And I kind of look, and of course, with my mind, why did God put it in there? And so I went back and I looked at it and I said, yeah, that was directions that they're giving. These were, these were sentinels. These were people that were supposed to be two by Parbar, which was, a, which was a, uh, a path. And the causeway was a bigger highway and four by the causeway and all that. And just to, to, to direct the traffic to and from the temple. And you would have to have, and it's been estimated, well over 2,000 people around that temple just to direct people the tens of thousands of people. Of course, that would include the priests with all the thousands of sacrifices and everything. But the Bible gives us intimate detail about how that he wanted to be worshiped in the Old Testament. And everything points to the cross. Everything points to the cross. And so we see that, uh, that these people now, as they are going out, they're appreciating. Um, I uh, like to appreciate our people and uh, give acknowledgement to people who work behind the scenes. And of course, <laughs> that's uh, the, the Wednesday night crowd more than anybody. But uh, there again, you know, just little things that nobody else sees or even appreciates. But uh, these people now, they are praising these people. And that, if, if nothing else, you know, that's, uh, you know, it's good to have a pat on the back from the Lord. But it really, you know, it's, it's good to have some skin on it, you know, it's for, for people to, to, to know that they're appreciated. So all you servants, all you who have worked, and of course the word stand, if you look at that in verse, uh, who stand in the house of the Lord, that terminology means that they have standing. They're the ones going back and forth. They're the ones who are inside doing the work. They're the servants, and they're not just standing around. That's not what it means. It means that they stand before the Lord or they are working before the Lord in the position that they have, wherever they are in that temple, whether it's uh, down, in the, down close to the altar or out 
by the gate. They're standing. Uh, they're standing as far as their service to the Lord. And of course, there'll be a lot of movement involved in that. So it's uh, just a term, which means uh, they're the ones who are serving the Lord. You'll also see that in Second Chronicles chapter 29, verse 11. And then notice stand by night. And so we have to realize that this t these temple services were 24-7. They were to go on uh, round the clock. And in First Chronicles 9.33 again, we see that uh, David set up singers for day and night. They were just, can you imagine choir? Uh, what, what, uh, what is your shift? Oh, we start at the midnight. You know, and what are you going to be doing? Singing. And then you have the priests and all the rest. And then the custodians and everybody. And who knows what's, who's coming out at midnight to worship the Lord. And so I, I wonder when Hannah was there at the tabernacle. Well, of course, uh, was it in the evening? As it was in the morning? Uh, poor old Eli, he hadn't seen too many women out or anybody out praying that much. Shows you the spiritual condition of, the, of uh, Israel at the time. He thought she was drunk. I wonder when that was, you know. Uh, was it early in the morning? Whatever. But uh, we see then that that was very important uh, that they... And of course, if these people are up at four o'clock in the morning or five o'clock in the morning before sunrise, then they're praising the people who are working at night. And so thank you for all the work that you're doing. Thank you that no matter when we were here, you were ready for us. And it was a real blessing to be here. It was very orderly. Uh, we didn't have a lot of problems. We knew where to go. We had the good directions and all that. And then uh, thank you, priest, for being so kind to us. You know, and, uh, I mean, who are the singers, you were so beautiful, you know, and all the rest. And so that must have been a real, just joy. And, you know, as a pastor, I'm getting more and more a desire. I want my people, when they hit that sidewalk out there, to feel like, my, it's been good to be in the house of the Lord. I mean, and just sense that I want to go back, you know, just I want it to be that. And how do I, and I'm praying, Lord, Help me create that, or help us create that atmosphere that it's just good to be in the house of the Lord. Now, of course, we know that the house of the Lord is the people in the New Testament, not a temple. We are the temple of the Lord. But just being around God's people and the spirit of the Lord and where he is, there, uh, where we, you know, where two or three are gathered together, he's with us. And people sense the presence of the Lord. And so we see that uh, he says he, they're praising God for all the blessings that they've had as a result of being in the house of the Lord and the people of the Lord, the servants, mostly Levites, who would have been uh, serving them. And then, of course, I like uh, Psalm 121. And this uh, paints a picture, of course, in Psalm 121, which is the second of the Songs of Ascent. Uh, we see that as they're going to, to the temple, we see he will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. Now, in other words, God is 24-7, so our worship can be 24-7. And so we see that uh, um, and the fire of the altar was to never go out. Um, the, the fire representing the Lord, and uh, it shall it was to be, and of course, um, in Leviticus 6.13, it says, And the fire of the altar shall be kept burning on it. It shall not be put out. A fire shall always be burning at the altar. It shall never go out. Why? Because it represented the presence of the Lord. And of course, that perpetual sacrifice to perpetual prayers uh, that we have a Savior today that is ever interceding for us. And so the idea, the, the, the continual presence of the Lord, and as I said, Zechariah would be responsible, and the priest, that was one of the highlights of their life, was to be able to be a part of the ceremony of changing those ashes out and making sure the fire keeps going, adding the... Um, than you would to the flame. And they'd probably have to do that uh, uh, through the day or whatever. But it was to never go out. And uh, that's why over, uh, I think in Samuel, where, it's, uh, uh, where um, Eli is there, and he says, there was, uh, the lights had gone out in Israel. 
Uh, did they neglect what God told them to do? And as a result, now the presence of the Lord had left. And so here again, we see that, uh, you know, we want to keep the fire burning, don't we? We want to keep it burning in our hearts. Uh, we don't want it to be a, an uncontrollable flame, although it can turn up the heat a little bit, but just that steady glow of knowing that I am his and he is mine and that uh, we can trust him. Uh, the highs aren't too high and getting out of control and the lows aren't so low that we don't come out of them. And so the idea of that perpetual presence of the Lord. And so then we see, um, of course, in verse 3, the Lord who made heaven and earth, we'll come back to that. But he says, um, uh, all day, he made, uh, he made, um, he also made the night and the day. The darkness and the light are both like to the Psalm 139, verse 2 tells, or verse, um, um, excuse me, in verse 12 tells us. And so God's always there. And he can tell the day from the night. He can tell the thoughts and the intents of the heart. He never slumbers or sleeps. Remember back uh, when Elijah was mocking the priest of Baal and uh, they were trying to call fire down from heaven and cutting themselves. And they said, uh, uh, yell a little louder. Maybe he's asleep. And so uh, he was mocking them. And of course, uh, then we see the true, true God. Now, Mockery is not, it's a dangerous thing. But in this sense, you know, sometimes, you know, even the Lord mocked the Pharisees at times, but you have to make sure when you do it that uh, the spirit of the Lord's in it because you're not trying to destroy people. You're trying to make them see the foolishness of their way. And so if all you're doing is turning them off, then you've just lost. But, uh, or at least to hear with the Elijah, choose this day, this day whom you'll serve, you know? And so he was trying to prove to all the Israelites. And so he was mocking them and uh, making fun of the God that these Israelites were coming and worshiping. And so, yeah, he had a reason to mock. And so, but here we see that, uh, that he is saying that uh, the Lord, uh, he never slumbers or sleeps. Aren't you glad you could talk, call him at uh, one o'clock this morning? Aren't you glad that you can talk to him any time of the day? And as a result, our worship never ends. Lift up your hands. That's the idea that the temple, the temple choirs and so forth. Again, in Psalm 1, they would lift up their hands as they would sing. I don't have any problem with that. You'll see people at times wave, you know, sing. Now, the swaying back and forth and really getting into the rock or well, that's different things. But as far as I've seen people pray with their hands up and I don't mind it at all. In fact, maybe sometimes we need to do it. I did it one time. And I thought, everybody thought I was going charismatic, so I kind of backed off a little bit. But uh, there again, there's nothing wrong with holding up your hands to the Lord. I uh, like what one uh, evangelist said. He said, we pray to the Lord, and then we pray to the Lord that he'll bless people. So as you pray with your hand, palms up, and then you pray that he will bless the people. And that's a beautiful picture. And so, uh, again, uh, nothing wrong. And of course, sometimes that'll keep you awake or keep you concentrating because you're doing something active rather than just your whatever. But you're actually saying, Lord, I need you. And you're getting your body into it. And not, there again, not so emotional. We're not trying to work up an emotion. We're just trying to make contact with our, or maintain contact with our Heavenly Father and have a sense of his presence. That's the main thing, is I know he's there. And so... Uh, but not conjuring up anything. But at the same time, the Bible says, lift up your hands. So there's nothing wrong with lifting up your hands. And so uh, David arranged the temple choirs to sing night and day, and as well as the priests who were there, if you came with an offering or so forth. But then um, um, I like what Hebrews 7.35 says, or 7.25 says, therefore he is able to save to the uttermost those who come to the Lord through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. So he's always making intercession for us today. I like what Warren Rearsby said, while you and I sleep in our part of the world, somewhere else on the globe, believers are worshiping God. Even more, our high priest, our high priest in heaven intercedes for us. 
That's a good statement. And so, aren't you glad that you have a God that we could pray to now at, what, 6.30 in the evening and uh, someone else is asleep in the world and we're praying while they're sleeping and they're, and vice versa. And aren't you glad that uh, God doesn't say, okay, you people in the Western Hemisphere, uh, pardon me, but I don't have time. I, gotta, I just got to get some sleep. Aren't you glad you don't have a God like that? And so we see that uh, uh, we have a God who ever makes intercession for us. And then, uh, so we see this is back, uh, these people, are they, as they're leaving, they're praying they're, and they're praising and thanking God for the service of the people in the sanctuary, and they bless the Lord. What a, you know, oh, that we would sing praises and bless the Lord with our hearts and with our, with our minds. And then as a result of that, and most scholars that I've looked at said, okay, this is a kind of a two-part psalm. The other is now the workers, and especially the priests, are now pronouncing a benediction on the people. And this benediction would go back to Numbers chapter 6. But of course, I like what he says here, the Lord who made heaven and earth. Now, all the way through Scripture, you're going to have a hard time having a God who didn't create heaven and earth. Evolution did not happen. God created the heavens and the earth. There again, I was with uh, uh, a retinologist or, or retinopathy or whatever they call it uh, yesterday. He only comes in on Tuesday. So I was with him and he uh, was working on my left eye. And um, I said, and I was talking to him, I said, you know, I just heard that, uh, you know, there's about six or seven different specialties within uh, ophthalmology. And he says, no, there's about eight or nine. I'm going, wow. I mean, it just keeps expanding. And just with the eye, the design of it, and that God made the heavens and earth, and he made my eyeball, eyeball too. And it didn't evolve. It was created out of nothing. And the thing that really gets you is that God even created my thinking abilities. There were no thoughts before I became alive, but he created within me a living soul. When did I start thinking? At birth or whatever, you know, maybe in the womb. But uh, even my very thoughts were created by God. Not, not that my thoughts, but my ability to think. I think, I hope you understand. But my brain was created by God. The chemical, and they talk about chemist, chemical imbalances and all that. That was all created by God. The very reason that I could talk to you today is because God created my tongue. And so here we have the God who created heavens and the earth. He's in total control. Every molecule. By him all things con, uh, consist. Colossians 1.16. We're held together by it. Just, it just is amazing when you really think about the creator. And to leave it to chance and to say that oh, uh, some big bang happened and then this bang happened and whatever and it took a billion years for this to happen. Well, tell me, why do I have the eyesight I have, as poor as it can be at times? And why, what about the eagle who can see for miles away or thousands of feet away anyway? And they can spot that little old fish down there underwater and they're high up. How can they do that? You know, it's just amazing. And so why did God not give the eagle my, I'd rather have the eagle. No, I probably wouldn't because there would be something that would not fit into my creation. And so we see that, uh, that he made heaven and earth. And so again, we see that the priests are saying, uh, and I like, again, what Spurgeon said here. He said, and he just kind of uh, uh, gives a definition for this verse. Uh, from the Creator, we, have, we are ample, new, there's ample, new, varied, boundless, enduring. All these are illustrated and guaranteed by his making of heaven and earth. I mean, everything, my God is good. And everything that I need, he's ample. He can su supply all my needs. Everything, they're new every morning, as we saw 
uh, in an earlier psalm. They're varied. God is not, uh, he's a God of patterns, but we're unique. And so there's all kinds of different things that are going to happen every day. That's why I'm fascinated with people. I love to meet different kinds of people from different backgrounds and find out uh, so much about them. That's the reason I'll wear that Navy hat around here. There's a lot of servicemen. I met British guys and everything, and they'll come up and start talking to me about service and when we served and what ship we were on or where we were. And I told you, I think, about the, uh, the, the British Marine that was working in pennies when I was checking out. And he saw the hat and we started talking. And come to find out, he and I were in the uh, service about together. And I was talking to him about uh, a NATO exercise I was on. And he would, but he wasn't on it, but it was, he knew about the British Marines that were there. And we just had a good time talking. And of course, that's a great time to invite people to church and uh, whatever. You'd love to witness to them, but you got people around you. So, you know, you can't do all that. But uh, just that open door. And what a blessing that is. But... We see, so he's ample, he's boundless, he's enduring. I mean, everything we need is wrapped up in the creator. It is he that created me and not myself. And so we see that that is permeated. Um, creation is from Genesis to Revelation. You're going to have a hard time with Romans chapter 5 if you want to believe in evolution. For as by one man, Sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men for all have sinned. When did death come to the world? When? After man sinned, right? So that wipes out uh, creation. Oh, excuse me, that wipes out, uh, that wipes out evolution, the survival of the fittest. And then you're going to have a problem because the rest of that chapter, it deals with the first Adam, the second Adam, of course, uh, Adam being the first and Jesus Christ being the second, two men who were, didn't have an earthly father. Uh, and he's talk, he compares that. You're going to have a hard time with evolution and trying to pick out when did Adam occur if God didn't create him out of the dust of the, 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 the earth. And so... The whole idea of evolution, and even theistic uh, evolution, the long day theory, becomes extremely complicated when you try to say anything other than that God spoke the world into existence. I believe I have a big big enough God to do that, don't you? By by, uh, faith, we understand that the worlds were made. And so I, I don't have any problem. I don't need to study how could it have been. I don't even need to defend it. I just, I know what I believe. I I know whom I believe. And I'm persuaded, I'm convinced that he's able to keep that which I've committed to him against that day. Or in other words, I can bank on what God says. And so, uh, again, we see that he's our creator. But uh, then, of course, their blessing, they're, they're turning now this blessing back upon the people. And of course, uh, I like the word you. It says bless you. And the Hebrew distinguishes between plural you, the second, uh, second, person, uh, personal, second person pronoun, uh, between, the, uh, the, between the plural and the singular. And this is the singular you. So actually, it is, you know, like the Lord is my personal Savior, but the Lord is our Savior. And so he's not just blessing all you people very impersonally. He's blessing each one of you. May the Lord bless you as you go back to your house, as you go back to your job, as you go out into your different country. Oh, may the Lord bless you as you go. Each one of you, not just, hey, big crowd. God's not a, God doesn't have a herd mentality. God deals with people individually. I have a personal Savior, and so do you. We don't have a church Savior. We have a personal Savior. And so he is saying that, that bless you. Uh, And so, and then that blessing, out of Zion. Think about what came out of Zion. Of course, they're going to Zion, but now they're coming back out with the blessings of Zion. But what do we see that came out of Zion? The Lord Jesus died at Zion. 
and the blessings. The church started in, in, at, uh, in Zion. And the blessings of salvation come from Zion. And what a blessing it is to know that uh, you know, God is still dealing with Zion. And so bless you out of Zion. And of course, to us today, we would want to say, Lord, bless your people through this church. Bless your people through this, these saints of God as we would serve him together. And one of the things I'm going to start trying to incorporate into my ministry, and, uh, and that is this priestly benediction. And of course, other more formal works do it in uh, other denominations or whatever. But that great benediction, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. That was a command that the Lord gave to Aaron to say, this is what you're to teach your priest to how to bless the people. And all oh, that our people would sense the face of God shining upon them. That God would, that they would sense the gracious activity of God in their lives. That their countenance, the idea that God is looking upon them and watching them very lovingly, that he would lift up his countenance and give you the peace that passes understanding in your heart as you go your way. What a blessing that is. And oh Lord, may we be a church like that. May we be a people like that, that when people are around us, they sense that something is coming out of us, that his, the Spirit of God is working through us and touching other people's lives. It's a great study, isn't it? I mean, there's just so much I've really enjoyed now. Um, and as you've seen, many times our longer uh, and more detailed uh, studies come from the shorter Psalms. But they're just so packed full of everything. And they're packed full of, of uh, so much doctrine. And uh, everything that's in the Bible is there for a purpose. And so that is why we want to realize that all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God. And even this one Psalm, boy, it sounds very quick, but you get into it. And my, it packs a wallet, doesn't it? Now, in closing, I said that I was going to give you the, um, the, the Pilgrim Psalm progression. And so I, this is what G. Campbell Morgan, he was an English uh, uh, theologian as well as a great Bible teacher. And he came to the United States and uh, had a great ministry, both in England and in um, the United States. He's, he was well known and wrote several books and commentaries. And so you'll see me quoting him many times like Spurgeon and um, other people, F.B. Meyer, some of these great preachers of the past. But um, Psalm 120, we see the hope of the pilgrim. 121, Jehovah, the help of the pilgrim. 122, the glory of the pilgrim. 23, uh, the helper of the pilgrim. Uh, Psalm 124, the deliverer of the pilgrim. 25, the uh, protector of the pilgrim. And, and the 26 is the restorer. 27 is the homemaker. Remember that about uh, uh, the homemaker and the blessed is the, the man who um, in his house. Then in the, ho the housekeeper, the homekeeper in uh, Psalm 128. Psalm 129, the confidence of the pilgrim. 130, the redeemer of the pilgrim. Satisfaction, verse 31, the assurance of the pilgrim. 32, the gatherer of the pilgrims in uh, 33, and now the rest or the peace of the pilgrim in Psalm 124 or 134. And uh, I like what uh, Dave said uh, one time when, when we got through with Psalm 119 and we'd gone through all 22 of those sections. He said, I, I kind of dread coming to the end of it, you know, because it was such a blessing. Well, now we've gone through the, the 15 Psalms of Ascent, and I'm kind of dreading coming to the end of them. It's a great benediction, isn't it? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Okay, you see a mistake there. That's an e, a T rather than an E, but uh, what a blessing that is. Okay, 
any comments or questions about what we've looked at tonight?